Jack Pinson. I'm a bowyer, which means I'm, I'm a longbow maker. Well, make, I make longbows. I did a four and a half year apprenticeship in longbow making um, with my master, Don Adams, who trained me for that time. How are we doing for a Can you hear me at the back and around? You can come in along this side as well, I think. Should be fine. I'm yeah. fighting the wind, I suppose. Great to be in Athlone Castle again, up here on the green on the, the green path, up on the battlements. And uh, thanks again to uh, Irish National Heritage for putting this together and, and Joanna Love from the castle. So great stuff. Um, yeah, so longbow making. But in the in the about in the 15th century and 16th century, um, the longbow was at the height of its uh, military prowess, what we say. Uh, it had the ability to uh, destroy fully armoured knights on horseback and on foot as well, which in its era was shocking to the whole of Europe, Western Europe in particular. Um, we see that most prominently in the Battle of Crecy. Uh, for the first time the, uh, in a large scale, um, the f a French army was, a French uh, Let's say it, it was a full French army, but it was uh, comprised a lot of um, knights and uh, French nobles and their entourages in full high medieval uh, 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 kit, clothing. So that's all clothing and also then armor as well. So full plate armor, and yet, and they've never been fully challenged. It was the, uh, the it was the height of military supremacy at the time in Western Europe. And, and then suddenly, at the Battle of Crecy, the English longbowmen, well, they weren't just English, they were a lot Welsh, there were a lot, a lot of them were Ga from Gascony. Um, so, pulled together by the King of England, Edward III, yeah, and his son, the Black Prince, on the battlefield, uh, to devastate the cavalry, the, the French cavalry, who were fully armoured. How, how did this happen? Well, it was a lot to do with the bow, but it was also to do with the culture around the bow, uh, around the shooting of bow, and around how uh, a long, the, the longbow was brought, well, it was just called the, yeah, the longbow or the war bow. We call it the war bow now, but it was the longbow of this era in Western Europe. Um, it became uh, a sh shockingly devastating weapon all of a sudden and allowed the kings of England to propagate wars in France initially and then against each other in, in a civil war after that. Um, so what are we talking about? I'll, I'll get one out here so you can have a look. We have two examples. that are full-sized Mary Rose replicas. So, I don't know how well you can see and everything else, but I have here two bows. I haven't put the strings on, they're off at the moment. I'll, do, I'll demonstrate, I can't draw these when they're too strong for me. So I haven't put the strings on, so I don't embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this one is a, an, uh, an, a witch elm war bow. Well, it's often referred to as a mean wood bow or a white wood bow. Um, elm is, it's pretty good for bows. It's, it's actually what the what Edward I first saw the the Welsh shooting against him, and what then he pressed into his army to go fight the Scots and the French a bit before the uh, Cressy. Uh, uh, so they were using big chunky pieces of elm like that. This is um, 112 pounds draw weight. And that's pound pressure per square inch basically, and that's at full draw when you're stepping back into the bow. So imagine that amount of pressure and weight on three fingers and then being released from the three fingers onto the arrow to shoot, shoot the arrow a long distance through and then hopefully through armour at the other end. And you, what are the features? Okay, so it's thickest in the centre, in front view, plan view, as well as in side view. And it tapers to the tips from around about the centre, both directions. The reason is to then, it, it, the reason for that is to get an even curve in the whole length of the bow. If you imagine a piece of wood that's square or rectangular and you string it up like a bow and try and shoot it, all the bend's going to be in the centre. Uh, yeah, it's just so it won't work and just break at that point. So to even out that amount of pressure over the whole length of the stave, 
you need to taper it. And that's my job as a bowyer is to taper the timber uh, and then gradually bend it and teach it to bend to tillery. So I'll come to that later. But at the for now, then that's the the, the main characteristics are the shape uh, is it's tapered from the centre of the tips in plan view and in side view. Uh, on the end, you'll notice these black parts. They're not plastic, but they might look like it. If you look nice and closely, you can see some grain in some of them. Maybe not on all the left. My left but that one has a bit there. That's horn, ox horn, or water buffalo horn, if you're depending what you're using. Can you see that nice and close? Though? Yeah. I've polished it a bit now, but uh, it is made of horn, and, and that's designed to keep the string in place. We can see a groove in the top on one side. It's a side knock. Uh, so that keeps the string in place and stops it jumping out and uh, also protects the tip of the bow where the pressure is very high. Well, where, where, this, where the force is cutting inwards in towards the centre of the bow. It protects the, the timber from splitting because of the pressure on the string and the same as on the bottom. So to look at, they kind of look a bit simple, a bit like bit, maybe broom handles or something, yeah? <laughs> to the, to casually, <laughs> until you look a bit more closely <laughs> and then you'll see the features. Um, uh, the other one I have here is made of yew wood, so this is more like what was being used on campaign in a military context. Because the, 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 the yew, the, the, who knows the, uh, the yew tree? How, anyone have any way to recognise a yew tree? Uh, it's evergreen. That's one thing. You'd often see it in churchyards or in uh, sometimes in hedges for like topiary hedge, hedge cutting. It's uh, it's a softwood. And it doesn't have a, a it has an arrow for the fruit, uh, which is a, a seed and a, a berry. It's not quite a berry, it's an arrow, different kind of thing. Anyway, um, yeah, so you has the best, uh, I'm going to get technical now, modulus of elasticity, which means it's really, really elastic, which means that you can bend it, but it will come back to its original shape. And that's by a factor of four times as good as the next best elastic elasticity rating in any, in any timber that I know of anyway. Uh, so it is prized for making longbows for that exact reason. So the, you don't want it, something that's flexible, like willow's pretty flexible, so it won't make a good bow. You can bend it all right, but it won't come back to its original shape. It'll stay bent, more, like, more likely stay bent. Uh, you want something that will spring back. So that's where you is the best. And that was what was used. It was harvested from high altitude grown yew trees in the Alps, in the Pyrenees and in the Caucasus mountains, uh, and then imported to England, uh, the Kingdom of England as it was in the 15th and 14th centuries, and produced then from cut staves, split cut staves, into uh, munitions grade and then high grade war bows, depending on what era. Uh, war bows we call them today, but the long bow is what it was called in this day. So that's, uh, that's some of the history of it, or some of the way the, uh, that they, they came into being as the prominent weapon of war in, in the Kingdom of England at the time, in the, medi in the late medieval era. Um, then about making them, so that's what I've been doing. Um, I've made all of these, I've got some more there to show you as well. Let's see if I can prop them up here without them blowing down. That'll stay. The thing now is to show shooting one, I suppose. I can't really actually shoot them, but I can show you drawing one back. Now, this is one that I've been shooting for quite a long time at various archery shoots around the country. It is also a U self bow. Self bow means it's just one piece of timber, there's no layers laminated into it. Different layers. I've got some laminated bows I can show you as well. Um, it's got antler knocks instead of horn knocks. It's just a little difference. I left them the shape that the stag grew them in, so they have a bit of character, as does the bow. You might notice in the bow, it's got lots of different bits of shape in it. You can see it's strung up there. I would usually leave the bows unstrung when I'm not using them. Um, it, keeps the, it keeps the spring in the bow for longer. But like any, any natural material, it will have a lifespan. So if you look after it well, it'll have a better lifespan. Um, uh, this bow has been shot quite a lot and it might break at any stage because it has a few little holes on it because it's quite tired and shot out. So uh, stand back here, everyone. <laughs> um, this is, oh, so I'll just show you drawing the back anyway. So three fingers go on the string. I won't use an arrow. 
don't usually like to point it towards people, so uh, I have to go uh, backwards. There's no way to shoot. <laughs> okay, I'll just go along across here. So then it'll draw back. You should always exercise your bow to get it to warm up and remind it that it's a bow. Uh, I'll go up high where you can see. Yeah, there you go. So that's drawing to my face like a target bow style. In a war bow, you have to step a little bit further and step into the bow. This bow doesn't have the draw length requirement for that, so I won't do that. And then you can imagine shooting it. So how far will the arrow go? I think out of one of those 112 or 120 pound U war bows with a heavy duty military style arrow shooting, you would go over the river easily at a, at a, a maximum range, you know, up there. I'd say, we'd... well, see the nice round windows. Don't tell them who lives in there. But we'll probably get... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's never shoot them at people or animals, I have to say that nowadays. Um, it wasn't the case in the past, they were definitely shot at people a lot. Um, right, so that's just showing you drawing it back and how far it'll bend. If you watch what happens when I bend that, or by drawing it, have a look at what happens with the shape of the bow. Uh, in, you've got to consider that there's a compression side of the bow and a tension side of the bow. The tension side is on the outside of the curve and the compression is on the inside. And so they have to work together. It's all bending, but they're bending in different ways. Like uh, you get coil springs and then you get um, stretch, I don't know what you call them, stretch springs. Would anyone have an idea on that? No? Yeah, so um, if you look at what's happening to the different surfaces of the bow as I draw it, those, things, those forces are going on inside the timber. Uh, and so one of the reasons potentially why U is used and has such a high modulus of elasticity it's because you use the sapwood and the heartwood on the bow. Can you see the different colors? Yeah. Sort of the stripe there, the darker reddish brown heartwood and the pale creamy sapwood is on the top. So uh, that gives it protection. The sapwood has high stretch and, and protects the bow from shattering. And the, the heartwood has high compressive for, uh, strength and stops the bow from, well, mostly stops the bow from fracturing. That, this one has got some chrysal frets. So it's going, going to be retired soon or else it might retire itself abruptly we'll see um, part of the occupational hazard of shooting a natural wood bow so I'm going to unstring it so it will rest a little bit I have a few examples of bows in the making here this is an ash bow or at least it will be it's not just yet Right now it's a piece of wood that's roughly shaped like a bow. Uh, but the next stage really would be to start tillering it. It's very stiff still. That's good. That means it will be very powerful. Don't know if I'll get a string on it though even. Might try a different one for that purpose. Well, no. Yeah, yeah this is a bit smaller, a bit more civilized. Ash bow, smaller one. So my job with this, after having shaped it, is to start to bend the bow. I'm going to find the top of it. So then I put a string on quite long with a low bracing height. It's not for shooting, it's for testing and training the bow. I'm going to tie a timber hitch in the end. You'll need to see this nice and closely to be able to tie it, but I'll basically make a loop, come up through there, go back around itself probably three times. Make sure the end is over the top there. This is the bottom of the bow. And then, so there's a timber hitch on there. I can tie that at any position, making the string longer or shorter. So at the moment, that means it's got, it's got quite a long string, so it's gonna be quite a low bracing height. I'll show you these things as we come along. Brace the bow up. This hasn't been fully tillered, this bow. So it, if I was to pull it back to full draw now, it's quite likely it would break. But if it didn't break, I'd be introducing a lot of string follow into the bow, which is permanent set or permanent bend, which is not going to be very efficient in the final bow. Uh, so then there's, I've got a very low bracing height to start with, and I can then start to bend it back while looking at it. You can put it on a wall, on a peg, and with a hook and a pulley, you can pull it back. That's what I usually have in a workshop, is a, a tillering wall. I don't have that set up here, but you can imagine it. And you hang that on the wall flat like that on a peg, a hook goes over the string and you pull down 
uh, a string, another string attached to the hook through a pulley, and then you can stand back up it and look at it. Um, and then what, where the bow is bending. So where is this bending and where is it not? Has it got stiff spots in it anywhere? So you have to train your eye now to see. If I draw it that way, you might be able to see. Is it kind of stiff around the handle, maybe? With the tip, I don't know, maybe it's not. I think it might be a bit stiff through here. That's okay. So the next stage then would be to maybe take a knife or a scraper and remove material nice and carefully from the areas that are a bit too stiff. And that's just taking off, off very fine shavings. At this stage in this bow, I don't want to be starting to hack into it with an ax or a draw knife or even a seraphim or, or a bowyer's float or anything like that. Um, so scraping it lightly with a, a, a sharp blade will do the job taking off tiny little micro shavings, you might call them. <laughs> Small amounts. Small amounts of material removed at this stage makes a similar difference to large amounts of material at an earlier stage in the process. So, a stage like uh, like this one here. So I've only shaped this a little. Well, quite a bit actually, but it hasn't been. There's no grooves cut into it yet. It's not ready. Well, it's just about getting ready to get a string on for the first time, but it's still really stiff. That's tricky and hard to bend. So at this stage now, I might reduce this a little bit more, especially in the center. And the way I would do that is on the shaving horse. So can anyone see, can you see why this might be called a shaving horse? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But it has the ability to use my legs to clamp the material in place. And then it frees up two, my two hands to use with this tool, which is a draw knife. Uh, and that allows me then to just carefully and, I, well, I can do it carefully or I can do it quickly and abruptly as well. With this, with this one now, I'm just going to be taking off high spots where there's... <laughs> How are we doing in the rain? Have you got coats? It's a good one to use them. <laughs> I see some coats and umbrellas around, so that's good. So with the draw knife, it's actually a lot of work can be done with this from a, a, a big chunky rough stave all the way down to a fine, uh, almost, almost finishing. It's quite versatile as a tool. I suppose we have a plane, I can use a plane as well, or I could use a spoke shave. At the moment with this one, I'm only taking off I kind of feel where I can feel with my uh, with my finger and thumb there where the ridges are that I left from the last time I was working on this bow, and then I can just careful. Oh, that doesn't want to go there. Carefully shave off. Sometimes the grain wants to dig in, so then you've got to stop and then go the other, turn the bow around and cut the other way. So I'll leave that bit alone until the other side. And then, if I get doing this too much, I'll stop talking and just focus on this, and that'll be the end of it, and I'll be here all, all afternoon making this. So I've got to keep, yeah, it, it, does, it, does, uh, it does make me kind of focus on what I'm doing, it's just like, it turns into like sort of a mesmerized kind of don't look at anything else kind of deal. Anyhow, I like that happen. So I'm cutting back the other way there, just over that rough bit of grain. Something that you might want to see close up in a bit. Oh, you get the idea. So that's draw knife work. A bit before this stage, I might use a, an axe like this one here in the block. So I can demonstrate that as well. This is... Sorry, I'm going to have to have me back to you. That's okay. This is a side axe, so it has a flat face on the back and a bevel on the, on the other side, and they meet in a very sharp edge. So what do I do on this one? I'm going to cut the tips down. I'm going to make some hatch marks going up the side, and then with the hatch marks allow, allow the axe to cut, chip down away to, to create the taper in towards the tip. This is only a small, but this might be a junior bow, this one. It's very short, but it's a nice piece of, well, I say nice piece of you. It's actually a really tricky piece of you because it's got lots of knots and weird grain in it. But it does have the potential to be a pretty nice uh, junior bow or someone who wants a shorter or lighter bow. But 
but then I can also do the same kind of work on the shaping point of the drawing line as well. Can you see okay from where you are? If you, if you want to come a bit closer, you could. But just be careful of the camera, don't block that bit. So that's the draw knife, it can be used as well as the axe. But then I might come to an area, like especially this tip here, where neither really can be used very easily, because there's too much interlocking crossing grain, maybe with a knot or, or a bit of, in this case, ingrown bark and stuff like that. So then I can switch to the Bowyer's float, which is a rasp in this, a sort of rasp, I suppose, we might know it as, but it can be used over something like that. And what that has, what that is, is a load of little teeth, like a surform or a, or a rasp, it's a bogus bloke. Um, it's quite blunt, this one, I think, <laughs> you can see there. Um, it has loads of little teeth and each one of those takes up a small amount and altogether it adds up to being a useful amount. Uh, it has the uh, added bonus of if, if there's a, a bit of grain which is swirling in different directions, it will take off a piece, bits of that grain all together without having to worry about a big chip being dug into the workpiece. So there's another tool that I would use, but I might use a, a slightly more modern version sometimes. But it's a similar thing. You might be able to see that's actually removing quite a bit of material. Uh, so it's very easy to go too far with one of these quite quickly and make a hollow in something. So that's why I'm using a lot of, um, I'm not just filing backwards and forwards like I'm sawing, but it's also up and down the stain as well. I'm gonna get these out of the way, under here. That drive everyone away. You can come in under the shelter, I suppose. Just be careful of the axe. <laughs> if you haven't got any shelter, do, do. We might as well. So where were we? Yeah, there's quite a lot of work to do on that one still. I've got to taper it. Take, well, I'll show you that too. Do you ever varnish them now or treat them? No, I, I, I oil them. Oil. They're all oiled, yeah. Uh, I, I prefer a maintenance finish to a maintenance free finish. It can be reapplied easily and if a varnish, get, a varnish coat gets nicked, you have to basically have a scratch or some hole in it, um, which happens in bows all the time because you're using them in and out of cars, you're going for shoots, you might be uh, putting, storing them in places. Uh, they get knocked. Varnish, if you get the chip or scratch in it, 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 you have to redo, sand up, rub it all back and sand it back and then reapply that area. Uh, whereas with oil, it's uh, less water, it, it, it lets moisture in more, so that's not as good, but it does let the bow breathe a bit better and you can reapply it easily over the whole bow with just a bit of rag. So that's what I have on all of my finished ones here. All right, so. So there's some of the processes in making the bow. Then the main one is tillering the bow, and that's what I showed you there with the string on the bow and just gradually over a few sessions, bending it back to full draw. Once the tapers are done and you're, and you're monitoring where the stiff points are and where the weak points are, if there are any, and uh, ad addressing them by small amounts of material, removing small amounts of material from different places from wherever the stiff spots are. And then there's the finishing, but that comes, so then that's sort of like uh, taking a piece of horn like this. That's a piece of uh, Southeast Asian water buffalo horn, but it could equally be ox horn, something that's solid. Uh, and then drilling out a center, a tapered hole in the center of it, uh, roughly shaping it first, and then gluing it onto, a, onto the end of a bow uh, that is close to being, let's, let's say it was a fully tilted bow, but without the knocks put on. I'd shake that down to be a taper to fit the drill, the, the drill hole inside the horn, and then I'd glue them together. 
On the Mary Rose bows, it looks like they might not have been glued. They were just relying on the pressure and maybe some beeswax or some paste, some other sort of sticky-ish paste that would be you could reapply uh, to hold the knocks onto the bow. Because the pressure is inwards and it would hold the tips on that way. But they all have a taper, um, quite a long taper, over an inch and a half to two inches. And they all have a little nick in one side and opposite sides on each tip. So it looks like they all had side knocks that would that were uh, sent like um, taper drilled, and they were matched up that way. You can see. Uh, so I, I can look. Yeah. So that's the Mary Rose bows in Portsmouth at the moment. They're, they're in Portsmouth from the Henry VIII's flagship vessel that sunk in 1545 in the Battle of the Solent. Uh, all, almost all hands died on board or through the sinking, and the. The, the swiftness with which she was covered in silt from the outflow of the rivers there in, in, the, in the salt water as well, sort of brackish water, um, uh, allowed the timber to be preserved. Now, in archaeological terms, that's quite unusual, I'm led to believe, by archaeologists. Does anyone in here? Um, that wood is preserved so readily where um, ferrous metal is all, all gone and horn as well, actually. Bone was preserved, but horn wasn't, that kind of thing. So it's about microbial breakdown and anaerobic preservation in the seabed. Allows us to see what, see the, the markings on the tip of a bow where the horn used to be and has since been eaten away. It's quite amazing actually to see that. You might be able to find some pictures on the web or if you get a chance to go to Portsmouth Historic Dockyard at any stage, go and visit the Mary Rose Museum and you can see several hundred bows. Well, usually uh, there's a few, there's a good number on dis display anyways. That, uh, 100, almost 150, I think, found, 120 full intact war bows found in chests uh, buried in the silt on what was the Orlop deck of the Mary Rose. So they're quite an amazing historical find for anything to do with, well, Tudor and medieval archery. We can go back a bit from there. Um, but then the, another question then is what were these archers shooting? Because that's a big part of what makes this system of weapon system work, and that's the arrows. So I'll bring out some examples here. We can look at some arrowheads. Who wants to be brave and come forward and see the arrowheads? <laughs> Don't they look pretty vicious? Which one is the nastiest one, do you think? That one there? That is very bad. Can you, can you see that one okay? I'll just twist, turn it around so you can see. That's a Tudor bodkin. It's like the uh, the Formula One of arrows, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the best one there. <laughs> um, very good. It sort of combines the armor-piercing bodkin head with a little bit of a broad head, sort of like one of those, a bit earlier style but shrinks it all down to be potentially armor piercing, but also lacerating as well. Okay, so we're gonna get pretty nasty with some of this because it's all, a lot of these are designed to be shot in warfare at people. So if there's anyone squeamish, I'm just warning you now, right? Because that's, that's what these were. Now, of course they were used for hunting, a lot of these as well. So like a big wide broad head like that would be for hunting. Could also be used in warfare, but it's not designed for that, it's designed for hunting. So I've got a few more examples of those types of broadheads. There's larger ones like those, the big swallowtail type ones here. And the big, big nasty, imagine that sharpened up, file, file sharp, so it's a, a sort of a, like a serration sort of sharp. Uh, very effective at hunting large game, in particular, I suppose red deer, uh, for the largest game in this part of the world other deer and other, other stuff as well. There's smaller broadheads to not destroy your meat so much. There's, there's a little a little one. Not much smaller, but something. So then we talk about warfare, right? So that's not, that's gonna do awful damage. These broadheads are gonna be horrible against animals, but also people, unarmored people. Um, nasty stuff altogether. It, once it goes in, it's not gonna come out that well. And then you've got to talk about infection and if you don't die of the wound, then you've got some other problems to deal with, getting it out again. A few different ideas about how to do that. The barber surgeons used to do a bit of work around that. That's another another group of people. 
uh, who are worth paying attention to. But anyhow, um, it's not going to do much, not going to get through armour very well. That's the key point about these. They're great for hunting, they're great for unarmoured warfare, but as soon as anyone wears a cloth gambeson, like thick layers of like 27 layers of linen as a jacket, which is what was worn a lot of the time, maybe not always 27 layers, but you know, layered up material, stitched together and quilted, or filled with horsehair or other kind of fibres. Uh, that's going to be pretty effective at stopping a, a, a padded gambeson, just cloth armour, textile armour, will be fairly well effective against stopping a broadhead like that. So then you need something to go through it. But then, of course, there were, uh, people were using mail as well at the same time. Um, as a gambeson and mail, so the two together. The, the mail would be to stop a blade, uh, a blade cut, and that would be effective against that as well. And then the, the gambeson would also act as impact uh, reduction as well, as well as cut cut reduction. Uh, reduction. So what was developed to counter that were these needle bodkins, like those ones. The features are there that it's a really fine tip and a very long narrow taper. So the tip finds one hole in the in the mail. Do you know what I mean when I say mail, Ringo? There's probably some examples here in the castle. Yeah, you can actually, um, if you go downstairs, you can try one on. There you go. A mail shirt. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Is it, and I'm sure it's heavy as well. Has anyone tried it yet? To the collection, it's very heavy. Yeah, they're, they're pretty heavy. And then you find the weight is on the shoulders and then you have to wear a belt over the top to let, pull, out, pull out a bit of the weight so it's around your hips as well. Um, anyway, that's just weight of armor. But um, those are designed to penetrate mail. So they're, they're very good at that. Of course, they're not that debilitating. Mean, it's pretty nasty having one of those shoot through your armor into you. But it's not a big open, a big wound that's going to let you bleed very a lot, you know, like these broadheads. So it's, it's a compromise, but it does work. It, it definitely worked because it was used a lot, and we find a lot of archaeological, a lot arch, archaeological evidence of uh, needle bodkins. Now it didn't work very well against plate armor. There's quite a fragile, narrow tip. There's another one that will bend quite easily if it hits something solid, like plate armor. So there was a a further development to, in order to pe penetrate plate armour, and that's where the shorter, shorter bodkins come in like that. There's a big chunky one, or maybe a, a heavier bow, or you know, could actually be a crossbow bolt head on an arrow shaft. Um, so big chunky ones like that, they're designed to penetrate plate armour. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they always penetrate plate armour, it just means they have a chance of doing it. That depends a lot on the armour, and the range and the and the, the way the arrow hits the armor. There's many, many tests, and you can look up on YouTube where those tests are about ballistics of arrows penetrating armor, uh, and it's really hard to define. Uh, so I recommend having a search, it's quite interesting uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, they did work, they had a, a good chance of stopping or at least debilitating. A man at arms or a knight advancing across a battlefield. We see that in, as uh, chronicled by uh, the various chroniclers from the Agincourt campaign, where who's familiar with Agincourt as a battle, the famous Agincourt. Uh, anyone know? Okay, well, there were uh, there was a small English army being attacked, attacked by a large French force, and the upshot was uh, that through a lot through the prowess of the archers, but also through the mud and conditions and the battlefield picked by the English king, Henry V. Uh, they, won, they won through, they did win the day, the English army did. Um, they weren't in great shape after it, but the threads were routed and got. We could do the numbers, but maybe not. Can you imagine about 40,000 archers? No, wait, sorry, I got my numbers wrong. Yeah, no, 4,000 archers, that was yeah, approximately. Now the numbers vary massively depending on what strategy you look at. I think a good, good figure is 4,000. If each one of those can shoot about 12 arrows per minute, who's good with, with their arithmetic here? Can you help me out? Because I haven't got the calculator here. 12 arrows a minute times like 4,000. Do we have it? Do we have it? 48,000 a minute, 12, for about 12 minutes. 
They had a lot of arrows with them. They think they ran out of arrows. That's somewhere around before that point or about that point. They used to stockpile them. Uh, the arrows were the limiting factor. And there's uh, talk in the cro chronicles of the archers going out between the advances of the French battles. There were three, three French battles and a, and a cavalry contingent. So two main battles advanced, and then the third one didn't bother. Um, uh, so. In between the two advances of the French, uh, the French armies, the English archers were, the archers of the English army were in the no man's land in between picking up arrows to resupply themselves because they shot so many in that first advance. Um, other factors contributed, not just the archers, but they were a high, a high definitely a large contributing factor to the victory at Ajaccio for, for the British crown, or English crown, as it was then. Um, so what other questions do we have? What other interesting and weird arrows do we have in here? We've got some really nasty three-bladed arrowheads. They are, again, for warfare. Can you imagine the type of wound that that would give a person if it, if it was shot into them? And how, how unpleasant that would be, and how much it would bleed, and then also how difficult it, it would be to treat, because it's very hard to stitch if you've got three cut marks into, into skin. Going pretty deep. Pretty nasty stuff. Uh, you want to have a look at these more closely? I'll show you around. There are probably kind of years that they started using the methods of All the way back to the Iron Age. Yes. So we're talking. They were using them in the. Or what was the. Uh, yeah, so Viking attack. In, so Linda's iron in, in, in Northumberland uh, would be what, six, uh, six, six hundred something. I can't remember the exact things. Ask oh, someone on the internet what they're doing now. So, which one? Can you pull it out there carefully? Ah, this one, yes. This is a, something of a enigma or anomaly. And it is, I think, it's a small game hunting head. So for hunting rabbit and hare and grouse and partridge and birds and other things like that. Ducks maybe. Ducks and geese. So it's a it's a bit it's a bit different in, in, in its makeup as well, not just the head but how it's mounted. If you notice it's uh, tanged. So the, there's a spur on the inside of the uh, of the arrowhead which goes into the timber of the wood and then you have to bind it to stop it splitting to give it strength. Uh, so that's an earlier format form. So that's more of a uh, Iron Age era. Well, yeah, Iron Age era arrowhead style instead of a, a socket like most of the rest of these. There's a couple more there that are tanks, so there's there's three more. That's nasty. They're both they're all nasty. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, th so those are tanged ones, and those would be earlier an earlier form of arrowhead made uh, easier to make. They tape. They just have to taper down a little spur off the off the end of the piece of bar. Whereas with the other type. You have to make a, you flatten out a piece of bar into sort of a fishtail shape, and then curl it around all, all hot with a, you know, a red hot wrap, a blacksmith job. Arrowsmith in particular is a specialised blacksmith to make arrowheads. Quite uh, without, you've got to make a socket without cooking all the carbon out of it. So it's very thin metal. It heats up very quickly, and so it's very easy to remove all the carbon content, and then it becomes low grade steel, well mild steel or iron like. Probably not cast iron, but I don't know my metallurgy so well, but uh, it's not as, uh, if it hasn't got carbon, it's not really steel anymore, and it becomes um, iron, which is less strong in impact in, in particular. So it's very skilled. It's a very skilled job making an arrowhead, because you're fine work and you have to have the right tool set up. Now that's a job, that's a, some, an explanation for someone who is an actual arrowsmith, they'll tell you all about it, and there are a few around. Um, I'm a bowyer, so it's not my main area. <laughs> Uh, but I can give you an insight anyway. A little bit. So that's the arrows, arrow heads really. But then another element is the rest of the arrow. If I can, of course, the ones with barbs on don't like to come out with them. That'll do. 
Now these have been in and out of bags a little bit, so they're not not as new as they once were, but here. Um, so there's a good example. That's a target arrow, so that's what's on the head. But the other part of it is the arrow shaft. This one's made of ash, and that was a lot of what was used in the medieval times for military arrows. It's bound with linen thread, which I've just noticed has been cut probably through transport. I need to rebind that. It's a little bit laborious binding the thread into these arrow into these fletchings. Maybe a better one there. there we go. Yeah, that's a nice one. Right here. So the linen thread's intact on that one. Now they were also treated along the base of the quill of the feather with um, copper oxide, copper oxide paste, and that gave them a kind of a green copper oxide mixed with something, some bonding agent like beeswax or maybe pitch or some other resin of sorts uh, to bind it on there and to protect the fletchings from mites in particular. So from attack from feather mites. And we didn't really have freezers back then because that's what you can do now to get rid of the feather mite. Uh, or an oven, I suppose. But uh, yeah, so those are goose feather. So they're the primary feather off of a goose wing. That's the, fir the first five flight feathers on any, on any wing. Um, they have to be either left wing or right wing on each arrow. You could, if you put the wrong fletching either left wing, if you, let's see, what are these? These are right wing feathers. So they're all right wing feathers. If I put a left wing feather on this arrow, it would make the arrow unstable as it flies because it, there's a smooth side of the fletching and a, and a rough side. So the smooth side is the top of the wing and the, the rough side is the bottom of the wing on the bird. In the fletching, it's the same thing. Uh, it causes a uh, high pressure side and low pressure side of the fletch of each vein, each fletching, which has the effect of spinning the arrow in flight. And if you put one wrong one on there, it'll do a sort of yawing through. It won't fly straight, basically. Um, and that was known about in the, in the era. They knew very well how to make good arrows. Um, another feature of this is the horn insert. Can you see there's a black stripe at the back end of the arrow? So that reinforces the knock. It's a piece of horn which you kind of slot out with a saw, uh, or you can actually carefully split it in as well, if you, if you clamp it. Um, and then insert a small sliver of horn, which you'd have to prepare in advance, which is quite labor intensive, doing all that fine work, and then glue it in and bind it as well. So the binding's on there and it's glued together. And then you cut your knock slot for the string. You see the string, the, the groove uh, in the other, the, other, the other plane, opposite to that? Uh, that's where the string will sit as the archer draws it back, like that. Um, the reason is it stops the string, the pressure of the string being released at, in, in the instant of release from splitting down the arrow shaft. Because of course all of that pressure, like 150 pounds of pressure, is being put onto the cross section of the end of the arrow in an instant, which is a good way to split it, so it has to be reinforced. You can't really make a, a, a full arrow out of horn, well, you could, but it wouldn't be a very long arrow. And even then it'd be very heavy and wouldn't really work very well. So uh, uh, in between the, the, the materials that are uh, bonded together and, and create a new function that way. So what else do we say? Yeah, that's the arrow then on the end of here. There's a nasty barbed warhead for unarmored combat. Uh, imagine trying to get that out of, once that was in, very bad. The wound it would cause, it's like, you can tell it's, a, for, it's not for hunting because these barbs are quite narrow and the cross section of the, of the point is it's got a diamond shape, quite, quite pronounced and quite thick. Uh, so it's, it's an, uh, an earlier version, well, an earlier kind of warhead before the, um, no, it might have been used can, uh, at the same time maybe as others, you might, as, as the armor piercing, you might have a couple of these inside of your quiver ready to be shot at the right target, as in someone without so much armor. Or a horse, very effective against cavalry in an unpleasant way. Um, okay, so that's sort of making bows a bit, what they were used for, when they were used, and some of the arrow stuff. Uh, I'd like to open it up to anyone who has any further questions about what it is I'm presenting here. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, you said before about using a more modern tools, like, where do you strike a balance between like, being historically accurate and being Right, yeah, so it's about historical accuracy to making a business work in the modern era, yeah. In, the, in this case, yeah. 
have to wait for the bills. Um, yeah, so I, I had a workshop. I'm out of my workshop at the moment. I have to build a new one on my new bit of land. So that's what I'm at at the moment. When I have that workshop up and running again, it will have in it a planar thicknesser, a bandsaw, a belt sander. I already have these things. I need to re-put re them up, uh, make them usable and accessible again. Uh, and various other uh, machine bench tool, machine tools, bench tools, and then hand tools, as electronic hand tools as well. But that being said, there's a lot of processes that I can't do with machines that I have to do by hand. So in particular, making self bows, the, the three that I showed you there earlier, they're self bows, they're one piece of material, there's no one piece of timber. There's no glue ups, there's no laminates in them at all. Um, uh, they have to be made mostly by hand. Um, I, I would cleave the timber with splitting wedges or, or a throw, uh, the, the, the log from the round, and then process it all with, with the axe, and and then and then draw knife and then the surf form or the float as well, um, because you need to follow the grain. I would need to take pay pay very close attention to the way the grain is 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 it exists in the stain. Uh, a saw will cut straight through any grain indiscriminately, but uh, if you split a piece a log, it will follow the grain, even if it's fairly straight, but there's a little twist or a wobble in it. The grain, the, the, a split log will follow that slight bit of uh, bending in the grain, which which you can't achieve with a saw. Or if you do, then you probably shouldn't, you know, because the saw is not working properly. <laughs> um, and all that, all that to say, yeah, there's a compromise. I need to make those to sell to people, <coughs> archers who want to want to use them, or if they don't want to use them, it's up to them. Um, I would make sure they're functional. Um, so with laminated bows, which I would usually tend to direct people towards if they're starting out in archery, uh, at least for a first or first bow or something, um, yeah, there's a few more machining processes I can use where the planar thickness becomes very useful because I have a, a tape, a, 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 a jig made up where I can put in a, 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 a core of material and taper it. I'll show you what that looks like in a finished bow. That's better to show you than to talk, use just words. It's hard to see on that one because it's a four layer. Let's try it with uh, this one. Yeah, a bit of contrast. So here is a laminated bow, not historically accurate to the medieval era, but definitely to the Victorian era because it was its it was the uh, Olympic class bow of its era, especially with the riser in the centre, the Buchanan dips, the riser or the handle part, I suppose. Which means you've got a stiff section in the centre that stops the, uh, that doesn't uh, that resists bending. Which means you have two separate working limbs separated by the handle. It's a difference to the historical bows; they bend all the way through the centre. So if you look at this mm, side on, you might notice that it's thin. The core in the centre is thinner at the tip and thicker in the centre, in by the handle. And that's a gradual taper over the whole length. So it's a tapered core. So that means that every cross-sectional area, so that has to be done in advance is what I'm, that's where the planer comes in. It's very useful for that. Once you set it up with the right jig. Um, to achieve that, I have done it by hand and it's painstakingly slow. Uh, so I bought a planer thickness there and I made a jig to, to make that with the machine. Um, there, that's strong enough anyway. So you can, so that means that you've got the same amount of this, each material of every cross-sectional area of the bow. That's the, the reason. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's, yeah, how to balance that. Yeah, uh, I guess have a workshop again, first of all. I had to give it up with my previous, I moved house and I had to give it up there, so I have, have to build one then. So if anyone wants to help me build a workshop, work away. I'm, I'm <laughs> I have to get on that. Been milling timber instead with a chainsaw mill.